Brother Rob. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he, he, we have a lot of these hidden talents in the life of the church, and it's so great to see God uh, surfacing some of this, yeah? So, hey, happy Father's Day to everybody. Um, I'd like to shout out a little happy Father's Day to my dad, who's in the room here, right there. And, uh, yeah, you know, my dad Regardless of what your situation was growing up, um, you know, we all have, as children, this thing in us that looks to our dad as like a hero, you know, there's this thing in us that just, we, we see dad as larger than life, you know, he's, he's our hero. And I remember early on, um, I was about maybe nine or ten years old, I don't remember the exact age, but I remember this one, uh, this time, when we had just moved to this neighborhood in Norwalk. And uh, my dad and I used to go play basketball uh, at the school down the street here, someplace, and we, you know, sneak in through the, the open fence and stuff, and we play ball on Saturday mornings. And I remember this one time where uh, there were these other guys playing basketball, and you know, ten year old just kind of picking up, just picking up basketball. I love the sport and all that, but you know, my dad was like the best player, at least that I knew personally. You know, and, um, and so we. we I don't know how this happened, I remember this day. I don't know how this happened, but there were these two other guys that were playing ball on that same court, and you know, we're just like, hey, you guys wanna play two on two? And I, I didn't initiate that, I don't think I did, but we ended up like playing two on two, me and my dad against these two guys, and they just seemed, they were taller, so they were, they were probably older than I was. 10 year old kid, 40, 35 year old, old guy, Filipino dude, and then these two guys playing ball against us. And I remember, like, there's no way we're gonna win this game. And so we started playing, and, and I couldn't believe it, man. My dad was making these amazing shots. Like, he would do these crazy shots I never even saw before. Like, he'd be like, boom, and he'd throw, he'd throw a hook shot, and it would go in. I'm like, oh, that's awesome, man. And these guys were getting frustrated, and we won the game. It was like, oh, awesome, man. I go, it's it. And, you know, and then I realized as I grew older, you know, my dad was really not that good at basketball. <laughs> it was just luck shots, you know? It was luck shots. <laughs> and, uh, but those were those were times that I remember that in my mind, Dad was larger than life. Dad was the hero, and I know that we all have some. Some of us have those memories, even if you didn't grow up with a, you know your earthly or your real dad. Maybe you had a father figure, and then you you just looked at him as wow, larger than life hero. You see, it's, we have this innate thing in us. We need a hero, and, and Dad is like the obvious answer to that that question: Who is our hero? It's no coincidence that the Man of Steel came out this past weekend. <laughs> and I want to show you a clip because I know that your dad's in the room who will enjoy this, okay? So my wife and I, at my bidding, went out and watched the movie last night, and uh, it's fabulous, you gotta got go see it. But I want to show you a little trailer of the Man of Steel, and I want to talk about what it means to live a heroic life, all right? Ready? Sit back and enjoy. Thank you. 
his tracks. For some, he was a guardian angel. For others, a ghost he never quite fit in. Superhuman strength 
superhuman abilities don't necessarily translate into selfless service for humanity or into living a life beyond yourself. You see, like almost every superhero, Superman has to come to terms with the purpose and the reason he's given all this power and all this ability and strength. And it's not until he embraces that identity and purpose do we actually see him fulfill his destiny. In fact, before he realizes who he really is, before he understands his history, he actually pushes back his identity. He actually maybe just to kind of downplay it. You see, this is what happens with us too. When we don't fully understand our purpose, when we don't fully understand the reason for which we were made, what happens is we either neglect our powerful abilities, our gifts and our talents, or we will misuse them. And maybe even abuse them. So when we were kids, we all dreamed of doing something super. We all dreamed of something doing, doing something heroic. And we all have that longing to live heroic, significant lives. And then as we grow up, somewhere in the middle of growing up, we realize life hurts. And so we adjust our dreams and our goals and plans accordingly because life gets painful sometimes, right? But I think the problem is, in the process, we go too far. We end up killing our good desires, and we end up giving up on a life of significance, and we settle for a life of comfort. And we settle for a life that says, all I need is just enough money to get by, all I need is enough opportunity to make sure my kids get an education. And that's not a bad thing, okay? Because we all, many of us who immigrated to this country, we came because of the American dream. But for many people, the American dream has turned into an American nightmare. You can't build your life around the American dream anymore, folks. We need something more. We need something deeper. We need something more than just a comfortable existence. You see, your life might be comfortable, but it's not extraordinary. Your life might be convenient, but it's not life-giving to other people. It might be practical, but it's not heroic, courageous, or adventurous. And if we're honest, what we're longing for, especially all of you men in the room, what is at the heart of a man is adventure, it is fighting a great battle for a noble cause. It's rescuing the beauty in our lives, which somewhat has to do with the opposite sex. But what we do as men is we mistake the adventure for the beauty. We think the adventure is to get the woman, but it's not. And we, we, we kill our good desires because religiosity has told us, man, you got to. Those, are, those desires are bad. You see, what's happened in our world is sin has taken all the good things that we desire and has destroyed them. God's not trying to destroy our desires. He's trying to purify them. And so, as men, we long for heroic lives. And the pursuit of the extraordinary life that God has called us to doesn't begin with opportunity. It doesn't begin with our initiative or determination to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It doesn't begin with that. According to Scripture, the heroic, courageous life that we're called to live, men of courage. That life that we're called to live begins with the love of the Heavenly Father. It begins with what God has already done because of His love for us. And Ephesians, as we've been in this series on the book of Ephesians, is this letter that starts out with the incredible, lavish, extravagant love of the Heavenly Father. Not only does God rescue us, He fills our hunger and desire to live a heroic life. And that is what we're called to do. That's in you, like the Gatorade commercial. It's in you to long to live a heroic life. You know why? Because you're made in the image of God. And God is the quintessential, the ultimate hero. He's the hero of the story. The story of the gospel. So turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 10. Verse 1 through 10. And we're going to get a beautiful snapshot of this God whose love and grace 
is relentless in his pursuit of us. We continue on in our study of Ephesians. We're at chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Let's just read real quick here. And if you have your Bibles, it would be nice for you to actually open up to the page and read it. If you don't, uh, you can look up on the screen for help here. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, now remember we've come from Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul is just full of praise and full of profuse, lavish language and prayer and intercession and praise to God. And he's, he's telling the saints, the believers in Ephesus, he's telling us and reminding us who we are. And then he continues and he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. And of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, ratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love, verse 4, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. Say, alive! the person next to you, wake up. Wake up. You're going to be alive today. <laughs> he has made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Say grace. grace. Yes. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Can you feel the, the profuse, lavish language that Paul is putting together here? It's amazing. And then he says, let me tell you a little bit more about this grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith in this, not of yourselves or from yourselves. It is a gift. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's uh, handiwork, workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word. Here's what I want you to see from the passage today. Okay? Just a few things. First, we cannot save ourselves from our death-like existence. As men, fathers, one of our roles in life as father is to fix things. It's to rescue our kids from peril, especially if you have daughters. Anyone, all the fathers who have daughters in the room, right, you know that you're about to, like, you know, there's a point in time in my daughter's life where I'm going to invest in a shotgun. <laughs> like I said, who knows, who knows guys better than guys, right? So uh, don't mess with them. We're here to be protected, man. We're here because we're there to rescue. We're there to fix stuff. But you see, this passage starts by saying to us, no matter how much you want to fix certain things, there's something you can't fix on your own. There are things that you cannot save yourself from. No matter how heroic you want to be, you are in a death-like existence. The word here is necros. It's the word, the, the, the word for death, necros, which literally means separation. And Paul doesn't just mean uh, physical death here. He's not talking about separation from, of our souls from our bodies when we die and when we act in this body goes to the grave. He's also talking about a very spiritual death, a separation from the life of God. A lot of times when he uses the word death, he's talking about this separation between us and the life of God. That is our condition. It's a kind of spiritual zombie-like condition. We exist on this earth, we're living and breathing, but we are never fully alive. We breathe, we walk, we exist, but we reek of death because we're severed from the life of God. Why? Because of sin and transgression. And so Paul says, this has created a situation on earth where sin and transgression create a death-like existence for people who don't know God. And not only that, it enslaves us to our cravings, to our lusts. The word here for lust is strong desire. It's not just sexual. It's lust for power. It's lust for control, for wealth, for anything that we try to put in the place of God. Anything that we think promises us life. 
but it doesn't fully deliver. And it, Paul goes on to say, man, we live in this condition because of sin and transgression. Sin here is missing the mark. Everything we try to do, no matter how hard we try to live a heroic life and fix stuff around us, it all, in the end, falls apart because we have sinned. We miss the mark. And not only that, we are bound to this lifestyle of sin. Almost blindly we follow our self-centered cravings. And not only that, there's another power at work to reinforce all of that. Paul talks about the ruler of the kingdom of the air. That's a way of him talking about the kingdom of darkness and the enemy Satan's kingdom who rules in that realm. Basically, he's saying, man, as a result of sin and transgression, as a result of the enemy's influence, this world order, this world system, breeds a way of life that is marked by hostility to God. And most of us, and he's all of us, actually, at one time, we lived under that system. We lived in that world. Some of you, now let me just say this. Some of you came out of some pretty heavy, crazy backgrounds. I mean, whatever, you were in jail, you were just a pagan, you just, you know, lived an immoral life, okay? Now, here's my guess. There's probably maybe 5% of the room that will say, yeah, that was me, Pastor. I lived an immoral life, right? That describes me. But some of you, or most of you might say, Pastor, I didn't live an immoral life. In fact, I grew up in church. In fact, I was forced to go to church. <laughs> Praying, you know, everyone talking about God, learning the Bible, all of that. But listen, we're not just talking about an immoral life here. We're also talking about the pursuit of morality as God. Well. Even religion can become enslaved. Even religious systems can be included in this system of domination that Paul's talking about here. That is following the cravings of our flesh. It's true. He said, even if I grew up in, a, in the church and this and that, I, yeah, Paul talks about it. He says, you know, these religious systems, they have a form of godliness. A form of God. On the outside, it looks godly. It looks spiritual. But when you delve into it, there's really no power behind it. There's no power for life-changing transformation. It's hollow religion. See, you can practice religion but you can practice it for all the wrong religion, uh, all the wrong reasons, and you can live still, even though you're religious, you can live in a death-like existence because you're separated from the life of God, right? And so Paul says, the result of that is, man, we were by nature deserving of God's wrath. I was going to talk about God's wrath. I don't think I'll do that right now. But um, just know that God's wrath is His natural reaction to sin. God has to do something about sin and injustice in our world. He has to. How, how can God be such a loving God and then be wrathful? Listen, I would be concerned if God did nothing about sin and injustice. You know what I would say? i say, that's a God who really doesn't care. To do nothing when the world falls apart and to bring no justice to the current sin. Uh, state of society is to say ultimately God really doesn't care. So God's wrath really is a function of His love, folks. You know, and in terms of the covenant, man, God's wrath is, is is Him getting jealous for you because even how many of you know even as Christians, by the way, this letter is written to Christians. Even as Christians, we stray. We go off and we serve other gods. We're unfaithful to God at times. You know what happens? God gets jealous, and he goes, why are you doing that? And sometimes we have to experience a little bit of his wrath. But that's a part of his discipline, that's a part of his love. Anyway, you get it. We by nature were deserving of the wrath of God. But watch this. I love this, because it says, the next verse, the next two words are, but God. But God, I call that, call that the conjunction of salvation. But God, we were deserving of God's wrath. We were enslaved by sin and Satan. But 
God. We deserved God's ultimate expression of anger. Even in our desire to live a heroic life, we ended up going to other things other than God to try to save us. We went to science and schooling. We went to relationships and sex. We went to stuff, material possessions and wealth to try to fill that void. And God says, no, it's not going to work. God needs to come and rescue you. And it's the beauty of it, man. God himself begins to initiate the rescue mission, the heroic mission of mercy. Motivated by grace, he comes for us. And we're rescued by his grace. Look what it says here. It says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Say, with Christ. Right? Right? Even when you were dead in transgressions, it's by grace you can save. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him. See, Paul is not just, you know, he's just not choosing random words here. He's using that word with three times for a very important reason. What he's doing here, he's saying that, man, God's plan of salvation for us, it's not just some formula for living, it's not just some code of moral conduct. God's plan of salvation was to give us Himself. And see, many of us look at the Christian life as if it was a big performance. That you just come to church and then they teach you how to perform well. And hopefully during the week you perform well too. And if you don't perform well, you come back to God and you get forgiven. You know, and then you try to go out again and perform better. Isn't that how sometimes we, set, we, we look at it? But the Christian life, according to this verse, is not a performance. It's a participation. This language is participatory in nature. It's with Christ that we're made alive. It's with Christ that we're raised. It's with Him that we're seated. In other words, in salvation, we're invited to participate in the brand new quality of the life of another person. Because in yourself, you can't do this thing on your own. Isn't that right? See, listen, many of us look to morality to save us. We do. And it's okay. You know, this is net, somewhat net human nature. You live, there's no one in this room that would say, Pastor, I've lived an immoral life. Man, you should try it sometime. There's no one in this room who would say that to me. In fact, if I were to pick all of you guys who, you know, you had a very immoral past, whatever it looks like, you know. I used to think that, you know, you could only have a good testimony if you lived an immoral life. And then God saved everything. And when I, God, I don't have a good testimony because I didn't do drugs. I didn't go, you know, join gangs. I didn't like kill people. I didn't like go to jail. All that, right? Listen, if I were to call any of you up here who lived an immoral life and said, hey, so is it worth it? Every single one of you would go, no, wait, are you kidding me? Pastor, no way. I would stand up here and I'd say, forget it. I'll stand up and give a testimony so your kids won't have to do it. Right? That's what you would do. You know why that is? Is because everyone knows intuitively that the immoral life has its limit, man. There comes to a point where you just go, I've done everything bad I know to do. The only thing left to do, watch, is to be moral. And here's the mistake we make. Just going from immoral to moral does not save you. The moral life does not save you. That's the mistake we're making. We think that if we just be a good little Christian girl and boy in church, that God will be pleased with me. But the moral life at its foundation is your attempt to try to save yourself in the power of yourself. Most people are not tempted by immorality, folks. You know what we're tempted by? We're tempted by morality. Oh, I messed up again. God, I'll do better next time. Right? We're tempted by that. Let me tell you something. The gospel message is not just that God can save you from an immoral life, but God can rescue you from a moral life. Did you hear that? Yeah. It's not about your goodness. If you start with your goodness, if you start with your morality, then you have missed what the gospel is all about. So, I just need to register because Paul is saying it. He's saying it doesn't start with you. It starts with God and what God is not. It's not about how well you perform. Hallelujah. Now, for us, like myself, we grew up in you know, performance-oriented families and, and performance-oriented 
picture. It, it's hard not to think like that. I have to remind myself every day, like today. Oh, God, remind me who I am again. I forget. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm not doing this as a performance to you. God, I'm accepted. I'm a child of God. I have to remind myself constantly of this. So here it is. It's not a performance. It's participation. That's why Paul says in another letter, I am crucified with Christ. It's not about what I brought to the table. It's what Jesus invited me to be included in with him. I am crucified with Christ. No longer do I live. Christ lives in me. And the life I live by the body, in the body, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. You know what he's saying? He's saying, hey amen. For me, guys, the Christian life is that I've been included in the death, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus. It's not my own. It's Jesus living on me, in me. And in the middle of all of this, guess what he says? It's by grace you can say it. He says it twice in this passage. It's by grace you've been saved. God's grace, he says in the first few verses that we just read, he says God's grace has rescued you from a death-like existence. He's rescued you from the domination of this world order and Satan's kingdom. But now Paul is about to shift and he's going to tell us now what we've been rescued for. I've rescued you from this, and this was not of your, this is not of your doing. God did all of this. I'm rescuing you from this death-like existence. Now, let me tell you what God is rescuing you for. He says, for it is my grace you have been saved. The verb here, watch, for have been saved is in the perfect tense. Now, this is what the perfect tense means. It means that something has happened back in the past. And this event has lasting, continuous effects into the present. All right? So Paul says, it's by grace that you have been saved back here. But this salvation, this experience has lasting effects for the present. Now, let me ask you something. How many of you can look back at your life and say, Pastor, there are things that I did in my life that were negative. Or, Pastor, there are things that, negative things that were done to me. Sins that were committed against me. And those sins that I committed, or those sins that were committed against me, had lasting effects into the present. Can, can you relate with that? Yeah? So, there's this sense in which sin is also in the perfect tense. You know why? Because way, way back in the very beginning, there was a guy named Adam. And he stood around watching his wife get deceived. Mm. Right, let me just say, just real quick. Guys, stop blaming your wives. I can't believe I only got one amen from a woman right here. <laughs> Come on, ladies, I'm trying to on your side. Let's go. Stop blaming your wives. It was our fault that we were in the situation. No way, Pastor. Eve ate the fruit first. No, 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 no. Yeah, she ate it, technically speaking. The Bible says that she was deceived. You know what that means? That means the enemy put together a very crafty plan to get Eve to eat the fruit. I guess where Adam was that whole time. Yeah, he was like standing right there going, oh, check it out. I wonder if she's going to eat. Now, now, think about this. Because at that moment when Eve ate the fruit, Adam had a perfect opportunity to, to stop it. And to say, hey, you know what? God, this is, play this out a little bit. Here's what could have happened. Adam could have watched Eve eat the fruit, and he could have said, oh my Lord, Father, God, do you see what she did? How are we going to help redeem this? He could have been a redeemer at that moment. What does Adam do? Like a knucklehead. <laughs> he goes, oh, it's a fruit too. <laughs> and knowing full well what was happening, Adam chose to rebel against God. That's why so his sin had lasting effects on our world in our society, in our lives. Let me show you this. <laughs> in Romans chapter 5, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all of us. Now here's the beauty. He says, 
But the gift, I was skipping verses here, but just work with me. The gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man had, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? In other words, when Adam sinned, fully knowing what he was doing, not being deceived, okay, by the way, let me just make a little comment here. This is why, guys, we have trouble speaking up in church. That's beautiful to see what was happening. This is the work of redemption. When you see guys on stage writing songs, singing, leading the church, it's always meant to be that way, by the way. The reason we fall in silence is because our first father, Adam, he was silent. He didn't say a thing when he should have. Okay, guys, so speak up. Take your place and lead your families. You know, don't just be under someone. Don't just be standing under your own. Right? Get up from out from under them and step into the leadership role that God has called you into. All right, so. When Adam sinned, there was an outbreak of sin's power on the human race. But when Jesus, Paul calls Jesus the second Adam, when Jesus comes on the scene, there's an even greater outbreak of the grace of God over humanity. Look what he says. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness Ray in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You know what I said? I mean, it's beautiful. I love that. It's like there's another part where he says, where sin abounded, grace abounds even more. Like, like Adam's sin, and this has lasting effects into the present time. But, but, but when Jesus came, Jesus' righteousness, Jesus' mission, Jesus' obedience to the Father set in motion a movement of grace that's going to swallow up. Sin is and, and he says, look, you don't have to wait till you die to enter into this abundant and eternal life that God promises. In fact, you die with Christ the minute you say yes to Jesus. And you, if you receive this abundant provision, why does it need to be abundant? Because I'm telling you, there's a whole lot of sin around us. A whole lot of sin in us, amen? God says, I'm going to give you more than you need. It's abundant provision of grace. If you receive it, now what else did he talk about? He said, if you receive this grace and the gift of righteousness. It's a gift of righteousness, folks. It's not something you earn. It's a position that God gives to you and says, hey, this is you. In, in some ways, before, God's, before, before God, you are no more righteous than you can be. You're as holy and as pure as you ever can be in the eyes of God. That's the gift of His righteousness. He said, if you receive this, then what do you get? You get to reign in life with, with this one man named Jesus Christ. What that talks about, that's a new creation language, man. That is reigning in life with Jesus. That, that's saying the new creation has already begun in Jesus. When Jesus got here, he said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. It is here. The age to come has already broken in, man. And, and you know what? You don't have to wait till heaven to experience this new life. It happens right here and right now. Receive the abundant provision of grace. Receive the gift of righteousness. And start ruling and reigning. You know why that's important? Because when God created Adam and Eve, what did he say to them? Rule. He said, dominate. Rule the earth. In a loving way. Steward the earth. And when, we, when Adam sinned, he took his rulership. God said, here's the rulership. Thank you for this tissue box of rulership, God. When Adam sinned, he gave this rulership over to the enemy. He forfeited it. That's why the kingdom, the ruler of the kingdom of the air is still very present. But Jesus said, hey, a time is coming, folks, when you don't have to live according to that power anymore. 
You can live, you can receive the grace, you can receive the gift of righteousness, and how do you do that? It is by grace you've been saved through faith. This, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith is how you receive the gift. Faith is how you appropriate the gift, how you apply it to your life. And it's not just intellectual agreement, right? I mean, we taught you to respond in faith. In fact, I, I said to someone last week, I said, hey, how would you like to receive Jesus right now? And she wasn't ready for it. She said, oh, well, let me think about it a little bit. Now. Okay, I get it, I get it. But I respect that. You know why? It's not just making an emotional decision. Faith in Scripture is a lot more what I call sticky. It's adhesive. It involves the whole being. I love this one quote uh, as I was studying for this. I ran across this quote from a commentator uh, on this scripture. Check this out. It says, people who, do not, uh, people who believe do not merely assent to certain ideas. They are bound to God and live in response to Him. Paul's frequent use of phrases like with Christ and in Christ show his conviction that faith joins them to Jesus so strongly that they are in Him. And watch this. What is true of Him is true of them. In other words, Christ's past is their past. And He determines their present and future. Faith has an adhesive quality. It binds the believer to the one who is believed. You have that kind of faith in Jesus. It's saving faith. Now watch this. So I like to say, you know, it's not just about believing in Jesus. It's about believing in into Jesus. Building into him. It's more adhesive. So he says, look, here's what God's grace has saved you for. We are God's handiwork. The word is poignant. Some translators say, work of art. We are God's masterpiece. We're God's work of art. Created in Christ Jesus, or I'd like to add, recreated in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Watch this. Check it out. Saving faith right, always leads to a life of good works. We never start with good works, but once you are saved, it should lead to a life of good works. And these good works he's talking about here are part of God's new world order, his new creation. Some of us grew up with this notion that God's just going to destroy everything in the end and make it all new. You know, he tried that. Remember the flood? He tried to destroy the world. In fact, he regretted that he did. He regretted he made the world. And then he went, I'm going to destroy it. Then he saw all the destruction. He saw one righteous family and said, you know what? I'm never going to do this again. Rainbow. There was a time when God said, I'm going to give up on Israel. I'm going to destroy this nation. Moses, these people are unfaithful. Come here, Moses. Let me and you, we'll make a completely brand new nation. There was times when God said, I, I want to destroy everything. But you know what? He doesn't. We think that God is going to just make new things later on. He doesn't. He makes all things new. He restores creation. This is why many of us, we have this concept of heaven, that we're just going to go up there and be him in the, in the sky, some other you know, eternal realm. And we're just, going to be, when we all get to heaven, what a day rejoicing. And we think heaven is, whoa, way out there. And yeah, there is an essence of heaven that is out there. Absolutely, we're going to be with the Lord. That's what's important. But you know what? In the book of Revelation, at the end of the book, guess what? Heaven comes down to earth. It's the restoration of all creation and humanity. And we get to rule and reign with God. And we're, we're thinking, man, we're going to be free from Norwalk. Those of you who grew up in Norwalk. You know what? This is how the new creation thinks. When he says, Good works I've prepared for you to do. Those of you who grew up in Cerritos, Norwalk, Bellflower, wherever, you know, this is how the new creation thinks. I wonder what Bellflower, I wonder what Norwalk is going to look like when God makes it here. I wonder if I'll be married. I wonder what I'd love to do for the kingdom in the renewed Norwalk. I want to be married or Carlsbad or something. Yeah, I want to be, God, I want to do something. Yeah, I want to live on the beach. Yeah. We think sometimes that, man, heaven is out there in some eternity. And sure, there's an aspect to it. But man, when I read the scriptures, I see that God is making all things new by hearing. This is, this is why this is important. Because your salvation doesn't mean you just get a one-way ticket to, to glory. It means that we need to work with God as
as he is establishing his kingdom on this earth, right here and right now. Although it is incomplete, one day it will be in fullness. And we get to participate in it now. That's why it's not enough for you to just come to church and fill the people. Come on down. Amen. That's why it's important for you to get to work for the king. That's what God is saying. He's saying, I have recreated you in Christ Jesus for good works. You know what those good works are? Those good works are the God-ordained, God-glorifying assignments and accomplishments and experiences that make up your unique kingdom contribution. There's something for you to do. Tell the person next to you, there's something for you to do in the kingdom. Yeah. So there's no such thing as retirement. All you older folks, there's something for you to do in the kingdom. <laughs> that contribution